All right, uh, let's go and get started. Um, let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. Okay. So, first off, uh, sign-in sheet. Uh, let me get that started. All right, second, let's, uh, let's deal with some housekeeping. So, homework number one is due today. If you have not already turned this in, make sure you have that, uh, that up here. Um, homework two is your first aggregates assignment. We'll talk a little bit about that throughout, uh, throughout the lecture today. But that's been posted on Blackboard. Uh, it's on there right now. And it's going to be due on the 19th. And it's going to be uh, essentially your bulkiest aggregate assignment. It's going to have uh, a, basically a lot of the fundamental calcs that we've already been doing uh, in class, along with your handouts from lab two. Okay. And probably what's going to happen is we're going to have one more homework assignment, a shorter one, which is essentially going to have a blend, maybe a blending problem on it, and then your remaining aggregates lab. And then when you turn that in, we have our first celebration of learning. So is everybody okay with that on the schedule? Okay. Now, because of the way this class um, is structured, you want the lectures to go along with the labs as closely as possible. And um, other than blending of aggregates and ASTM standards, I've got to be honest with you, there's not a whole lot left to talk about when it comes to aggregates. There just really isn't. Um, we're actually uh, making time uh, a lot faster than I thought we would. So um, what I'm going to do is, as of now, I'm going to cancel class on Thursday. Okay? Let me be clear. We're still meeting for lab. And all these, you know, celebratory responses, not, you know, you know, I thought you enjoyed having class with me. You know? and my feelings are getting hurt. <laughs> Just do that. Um, so we're going to cancel class on, on Thursday, but we will still meet for lab. So I want everybody here at 2 o'clock in this room to do lab. Uh, our lab this week is essentially, it's going to be probably a little shorter than the lab we did last time. We're going to look at, shape, uh, last time we did shape of coarse aggregate, this time we're going to do a shape of fine aggregate lab, and we're going to talk a little bit more, or we're going to do a little bit more associated with moisture contents in this lab because we're going to do an absorption lab. So if you recall, absorption is nothing more than a moisture content at a very special state. Remember, it's the moisture content at a saturated surface dry condition. So what we're going to have to do, it's going to be a lot like the moisture content lab we did last time, where you have a sample, you weigh it, um, uh, you weigh it moist, you dry it in the oven, you weigh it dry, and you compute a moisture content. And you're not going to compute that any differently in this lab than you did in the previous lab. The only difference is um, we have to get our sample at a particular moisture content, at a very specific one. So there's a uh, sort of an additional experiment that we have to do to ensure whether or not our sample has indeed met that, uh, that particular moisture content. So that's going to be the, the nature of what we do uh, with the absorption lab. One other point I'll mention, um, if you recall during lab last time, um, I went and uh, I got sort of group leaders, if you will, for each group. All of those group leaders should now have card access. So you need to go, uh, you should probably go and test it out uh, and make sure that that's working. Did everybody get their data from, from lab on Friday? All right. I, ho I hope at least somebody in your group does because you'll need that for your, uh, uh, for your homework. Okay. So everybody good? Any questions? Okay. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about the ASTM standards. I'm going to bring those up very briefly, uh, and then we'll get into uh, blending of aggregates, and we'll get into an example of that um, today. Now, <laughs> I wanted to pull up um, Blackboard real quick. Let me go into student preview so it at least looks a little bit like what you all see when you log in. When you go to course content, you'll see the aggregates assignment posted, but you'll also see ASTM standards. Instead of creating like 10 or 12 different posts, what I'm probably going to do is just on this single post, just add to this the ASTM standards that I think uh, are going to be appropriate. Let me be clear, I am not going to post every single ASTM standard that we ever reference in this class. I'm just not doing that. Uh, there's really no point. But there are a few of them that I am going to post because I want you to sort of get a flavor for, um, for, for, for their use. 
I'm going to pull up a couple of them right now just to kind of give you an idea of what an ASTM standard looks like. And then one of them I want to dig into because you're actually going to need to use this for your, uh, for your homework assignment. So I, I want to take a look at this. We've actually already seen the spec before, but I, but I want to sort of uh, relate this. So let me, let me pull one up. Let me, uh, let's try the moisture content one. Okay. So this is uh, an ASTM standard. Um, this is uh, ASTM D2216. Uh, the dash 10 uh, re uh, references what year we're talking about. So this standard is up to date as of 2010. And I've got to be honest with you, these standards, uh, some of them change quite frequently. Some of them really don't. Um, you know, for instance, like the sieve analysis standard. I mean, I'm sure there are very minor, uh, you know, minute things that have updated, but in the end, a sieve analysis has been a sieve analysis uh, essentially for decades, and that's not going to change. Um, <laughs> what we've got here is the standard test methods for labora uh, laboratory determination of moisture content um, uh, of a soil or a rock by mass. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it, um, but there's a couple things that are, that are worth mentioning. You know, they, they all tend to be uh, organized in a very similar fashion. You know, the first thing that you will see is the scope. In other words, what this uh, particular standard is meant to assess. It's meant to determine the so uh, moisture content of uh, soils or uh, uh, aggregate type mixtures. It wouldn't be used to determine the moisture content of, of steel. That would, wouldn't make sense. So um, it, it, it starts off by just sort of listing, you know, where this is applicable. Um, one of the things that you will find is that ASTM standards tend to reference one another. For instance, if you're looking at the standard for uh, determining, um, I don't know, if you're looking at action, or if you're looking at, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, preparation of concrete cylinders or, or something like that, uh, you know, if you look in that standard, it might tend to refer to this one and vice versa. So you'll find that, that ASTM standards tend to reference one another, so that's what you've got here. You know, you'll see um, terminology, um, uh, you know, what is water content, what is constant dry mass, et cetera. We've seen a lot of these uh, uh, definitions already. But I, look right here. Okay, I want to zoom into this. So summary of test method. This is number four. A test specimen is dried in an oven at a temperature of 110 degrees Celsius, you know, plus or minus five degrees, to a constant mass. The loss of mass due to uh, drying is considered to be water. The water content is calculated uh, using the mass of water and the mass of dry specimen. Is that, in a nutshell, what we did in lab, right? That's basically it, okay? Um, I, I wanted to do something a little flipped um, with, uh, with, with, uh, with this class. Instead of showing you the ASTM standard first, which the first time you see one of these things, I think it can be a little intimidating. There's a lot of stuff going on, and there's a lot of terminology and sections and D 2.2 slash section subsection A and all this and it, it can you know um, it can be a little intimidating the first time you see it. What I wanted to do is actually do the experiment and then sort of go back and see if, if what we did in lab actually matched that and I think you'll see what it is uh, or that it is. Um, you know once you see the the summary of test method they'll go into a significance uh, 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 discussion you know what it's being uh, what this is going to be used for uh, etc. Apparatus, okay, so what equipment do you need? So, well, we need a drying oven, we need balances, we need specimen containers. We used all that in the lab, right? Now, this gets into a very um, technical delineated uh, description. You know, for instance, drying oven. Vented, thermostatically controlled, uh, preferably of the force draft height, meeting the requirements of specification, sorry, specification E145, and capable of ma uh, maintaining a uniform temperature of 110 degrees plus or minus 5 degrees Celsius. That long and short is the oven that we use in the lab. And you can see other descriptions on specimen containers uh, and things like that. Um, samples, uh, it talks about the samples that we, you know, the, the specifications that, that we need to follow in order. Storing them uh, in terms of the test specimen, test specimen selection, you keep going on. Here's the procedure, you know, 10.1, determine and record the mass of the clean and dry specimen container. Uh, and its lid if used along with its identification number. This is stuff we did in the lab. You know, record the tear, record the tear ID number. Select representative test specimens. That's what we did. Place the moist uh, uh, test specimen in the container and if used, uh, set the lid in, in a securely in position and then so on and so forth. You can see, I mean, you go through and read this, you'll see this is exactly what we did in the lab. I, I definitely encourage you to take uh, th these uh, uh, ASTM standards, especially the ones that we have already done, 
and go through them because I think now that we have already done them, going through the uh, the ASTM method and uh, and digesting this, I think will be a, a little easier. Now, one thing to point out, you know, in our sieve analysis, uh, some of our sieve stacks didn't quite match what was in the ASTM standard, and that, that's actually uh, fine for our purposes and what we're doing in this class. A, I wanted to mix it up a little bit so that you all would. Uh, feel a little more comfortable with, you know, plotting on, a, on the uh, gradation chart um, between the differences you're going to get in the lab and differences on what you're going to get on homework problems. You'll get a fair amount of practice using that uh, semi-log plot, so uh, that's just more from an educational standpoint. But also, um, I think we, uh, you know, going through the equipment, I think we can only form so many stacks that actually meet the specs, so we could have sat there and done that and been there for four hours, or we just arrange some stacks together and get the lab done and I think that um, that made most sense in the lab. Is everybody okay with this standard so far? I urge you to go through and, and just look through the others. The one I really want to, to focus on right now is ASTM C33. Now C33 is the standard spec for concrete aggregates and, and what this spec is essentially trying to do is delineate uh, if you're going to use you know a coarse aggregate or a fine aggregate or something like that for a concrete application for uh, Portland cement concrete uh, and the like, we're going to be talking about Portland cement concrete uh, a little later on in the semester, then that aggregate needs to meet uh, you know, certain specifications. Now, um, we'll talk about the coarse aggregate spec later because for coarse aggregate, if you scroll down, these are the grading requirements for coarse aggregates and you can see you know, we've got four inch sieves, three and a half inch sieves, three inch, two and a half and so on and so forth. Depending upon the size of stone that you're looking at, there's a whole host of different gradation requirements that you would need to meet. For coarse aggregates, it's a little more uh, involved. For fine aggregates, it's pretty simple. So if you, if you scroll down, if I go down here for fine aggregate, there's only really one spec that you've got to meet, and that's this. So let me zoom in a little bit further. So scroll over right here. Okay, so this is the grading requirements for fine aggregate. And so, for instance, if you've got a number four uh, sieve for your aggregate to meet the specification for fine aggregate for concrete, then 95% to 100% has to pass the number four sieve. For the number eight, 80 to 100% has to pass. For the number 16, 50 to, uh, to 85. These numbers uh, you've actually seen before. We, looked, we saw these in a, in a lecture. Uh, let me go to the lecture notes. Remember these, these specifications, that's where they came from. They just came straight from the ASTM standard. So for number four says 95 to 100 percent, number eight says 80 to 100, uh, et cetera. So I am going to want you all to do this on the lab data. You all probably have a plot that's something like this, this center plot where you've plotted your, your sieve analysis data from the lab. I want you to plot the spec on top of it, and I want you to see if the aggregate that we're using in the lab is it going to meet the specifications for fine aggregate for concrete. Is everybody okay with that? I want to I want to see what you all uh, you all come up with on that. Any questions? Mm-hmm. Yes. For the most part, for the most part. Um, let me pull something up real quick. So let me pull up the second homework assignment. Um, there's, one, there's a couple calcs that I'm not going to worry about. So this is the assignment that was posted. Um, if you go down here, so it says complete and attach the handouts from Laboratory 2. So all I want are the data sheets and the relevant plots. If you've got separate calcs that need to be uh, that need to be performed. If you don't have room to do them on the data sheets, you can put them on a separate sheet of paper. But like, for instance, a, a fineness modulus, like if you can just fit that on the sheet, just do it there. Like, I, I, you don't need to have a whole separate sheet of quad paper. Um, I want you to, uh, so, so that we're, we're clear on what needs to be done for the lab, I want you to refer to the fine aggregate specs that I just showed you all from ASTM C33 for the SIP analysis. So when you plot you know, you've got your data in the lab and you've got your specs. I want you to go from uh, off ASTM C33. Uh, if you look on the sieve analysis um, calculations at the back, there's a step six that says the 0.5 power gradation chart. Don't worry about that. That's just another way of plotting 
uh, uh, sieve analysis data, and I'm, I'm not really concerned about that at this stage, so I, I'm not really going to worry about it. Um, now, for step seven, where you need to determine the fineness modulus, um, you have to use the sieves that are present in that formula that you see below. Like, it says, like, hold on, let me, let me pull up the handout. Um, I, and I, I'm being sort of um, hard on this rule for a specific reason. Um, let me see. I, I know, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, so, so here's the printout. Okay, so, all right. So it says here, um, you know, to calculate your fineness modules, you're going to use the cumulative percent retained on these particular sieves, right? And what you're going to find is maybe you don't have a number 30 sieve, maybe you don't have a number 16 sieve or what have you. You still need that data in order to compute this value. So you go, okay, well, what do I do? Well, here's essentially what you're going to do is this. Um, let me go to, let me go to, oh, lecture notes. Let's go to this. Okay, do you remember this example that we did in class where we did the sieve analysis of the, the data that was presented? Some of those sieves aren't present either, okay? So, Essentially, what you're going to have to do is, is linearly interpolate. So, let me see. Let me pull this. Okay, so you need data from, let's say, the number 30 sieve. Is the number 30 sieve? All right, perfect. Okay, so you need data from the number 30 sieve, but if you recall from this example, we didn't have a number 30 sieve. Well, that's where linear interpolation comes into play. So, just find you know, the number 30 sieve right here, and that's, what, about 68%, something like that? That's what you're. That's what you're going to do. Now this. Now let's also be clear. What's being plotted on this chart right here is percent passing, not cumulative percent retained. So how do you get cumulative per percent retained from percent passing? Hundred minus that. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with yes. What do you mean? No, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, let, me, let, me, let me pull something else up. When we say cumulative percent retained, we are talking about like this problem right here, okay? So just because you have like a number 100 sieve doesn't mean you're going to have all the data from the sieves above. Does that make sense? Okay, what I'm talking about is this. When you pull the data from the sieve analysis plot, what you're getting, you know, what you're getting from your plot is essentially this. So if you use linear interpolation to find something in between, that's fine, but you're getting percent passing. What you need for a fineness modulus is cumulative percent retained, and that's 100 minus that. So if you linearly interpolate, going back to the example we just looked at, if you've got, um, like let's, you know, you need the data from the number 30 sieve, and that's right here, right? So from a percent passing standpoint, that's about what, like 68%? Is that fair? That's percent passing. Cumulative percent retained, it's not 68, it's 32. Did I do that right? Does that make sense? Did, that, did I answer your question, though? to get the data for the number 16 and the number 8. Okay, but we also still our 10. No, 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 just these. Just those, yes. Okay. Yep. Does that make sense? I want you to, let me say this. The reason why I'm doing this, I want you to have a fair amount of experience with linear interpolation. If it's not something you're comfortable with, um, I, I want you to get comfortable with it. It's also going to become pretty relevant when we talk about blending here in a second. And I think you'll see what I mean as we get into this. Is everybody else okay with that? Yes. Um, are we going to, is there a place on Blackboard to turn off the mean aggregation and the staircases? Can I go get staircases and charts? No, but it, it'll be the same deal. Well, they're, they're posted, so if you want to print them, you can. But first off, I've got copies here, 
And it's the same deal. I've got copies. I've already got printed copies on my uh, my little card outside my office. So I printed off something like 150 uh, gradation sheets, and I think I printed about 100 of these, in addition to the ones I'm giving you today for our in-class example. You got plenty. It's more. Look, it's it's not like you're going to need. All, it's more like if you do it and you mess up, do you want to erase everything or just start on a new one? So. I've been around the block. I know. I know how this goes. Does anybody have any questions? All right. What? All right. I'm going to pass some 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 charts out. Let's do some blending. All right. So one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I hope you all have a straight edge or something of the like today. You're going to need it. What's that? Oh my goodness. I told you all to bring some straight edges. My all right, there's a lot of people in this room. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's that. There's that. I'm just going to give you all the rest. Okay. Now, I want to show you all, sort of walk you through again how we're going to do this, and we're going to take our time step by step to determine this blending process. I think you're going to find, as we take our time through this, this really isn't that bad. Okay. Um, I want to go through the notes real quick, though, and sort of refresh everybody on why we're doing what we're doing. Okay. So right now and up until now, what we've been talking about is essentially trying to characterize a given aggregate, see if it's specifications for an intended use. And right now, our focus is that that intended use be a, a concrete application. So the first thing that you would do, for instance, if we're looking at uh, gradation, is we performative analysis. So we'll get you know, this center trend of data that you see right here, and we would plot that against the specification. So those blue lines that you see there are the uh, lower and upper bound limits of the spec. Now in this particular example, what you see is that the aggregate falls within the specification. So the long and short of it is we could take this aggregate and use it for uh, concrete right now. But it's very possible that an aggregate does not meet specifications. Okay, so let's see. Let me skip it. We already talked about all this. I want to look at uh, go back to looking at this particular example right here. So if I look at, for instance, let's just take a look at aggregate A by itself. So this is aggregate number A, and what you see here is percent passing. So this would be directly from a sieve analysis plot. Now let's take the number four sieve. Okay. Now the number four sieve for aggregate A, only 16% passes uh, that, particular, uh, that particular sieve. But the specification requires that 50 to 70% pass in order to meet the spec. Make sense? So aggregate A by itself could not be used for this intended application. All right? Likewise, aggregate B couldn't be used either. I mean, if I look at aggregate number B, or ag aggregate letter B, um, number four sieve, I have 96% passing the number four sieve. Well, 50 to 70%, that doesn't uh, apply either, right? But what if I took a little bit of aggregate A and a little bit of aggregate B and mixed them together, okay? Well, essentially, if we do that and we assume essentially linear interpolation, you know, if I've got, let's, let's just keep it simple. If I got 16% passing the number four with aggregate A and 96% passing aggregate B, and if I just did half and half, well, if I average these two, that's about how much is going to pass the number four. Does that make sense? So the idea is to determine, well, if I've got an aggregate like aggregate uh, number A, or I keep going number, but aggregate A, uh, aggregate A, which is uh, probably looking at the numbers a somewhat, uh, a somewhat bigger aggregate, Aggregate number B, which is a somewhat smaller aggregate, if I've got an aggregate A, which is a little too coarse, this is a little too fine, maybe if I can come up with a way of blending those two aggregates together, I can meet the specification. 
So I want to walk you through how we do this uh, using a graphical approach, and I think you'll see uh, we're going to do some calcs with it uh, uh, near the end. And I think you'll see this is actually this is a pretty straightforward uh, process. Okay. So we start off with a chart that looks something like this. Now this chart's already filled in. The chart you have is blank. We're going to fill it in uh, throughout this, uh, this given example that we do. But here's the long and short of it. So the first thing that you do is you determine where your, uh, your percent passing is on either side. Now this might seem a little strange, but just make sure you, you pay attention to this. So over here on the right, this is aggregate A. This is aggregate B over on the, uh, on the right side. So you'll notice these numbers here where it says like I've got something in the 90s and then something a little higher than 80 and then something a little higher than 50. That comes from right here. So we got you know, 96, 82, 51, 36. I'm essentially plotting those values here, plotting those values here, and then drawing a straight line in between them. Does that make sense? So, so the idea is that each of these lines that are being connected represents a given sieve. So this line might be the number four sieve. This line might be the number eight sieve. This line might be you know, the number 16, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these lines represent a given sieve. And let's be clear, we're using linear interpolation. So the idea is you know, this is my gradation for aggregate B. This is my gradation for aggregate A. So dependent upon my blend, you know, for instance, if I use 80% of B, this is basically a graphical means to determine, well, if this is my blend, how much is going to pass each individual sieve. D does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. So this is, um, so this is essentially the first step is to, uh, is to con draw, I guess, what we're calling our sieve lines. The next step is to plot out the, the, uh, um, the ranges, essentially, for our upper bound and lower bounds for our given specs. So for instance, what we're doing right here, it, if it seems a little confusing, so for instance, if I'm looking at, let's say, the number four sieve, the number four sieve, the specification has to be anywhere between 50 uh, and 70 percent. So here's our uh, gradation, here's our sieve lines. So for instance, if this line, let's say this line right here is the number four sieve, then this point right here, if you drag it over, that's 50 percent, and this point over here, that's 70 percent. And it's the same axis on either side, so it really doesn't matter. And then what I do is I, uh, I connect my upper bound and my lower bound lines to get sort of a range of applicability, if you will. What I then say is, I skip ahead and I say, this point right here, you can imagine sort of taking a vertical line and sort of sort of going like this. This point right here, this is sort of the worst case scenario that if I use this blend, will meet all of these given specifications. Likewise over here, if I sort of take this and go that way, once I hit here, you can see where it intersects right there, that meets the specification on the lower bound. Does that make sense? Everybody kind of see that? So what I'm getting at, is that I propose that any blend that's inside here would be an acceptable blend. So what I'm going to do is just take the average and say that's the blend that we need to use. Now in this particular example, it's exactly 50%. The example that we're going to do here in a second, it's not going to be 50%. Is everybody okay with that? Don't worry if, it, if the details are getting lost on you as we step by step go through it and prepare this. I think you're going to see it's not so bad. Um, once you determine your final blend, you can determine the percent passing each individual sieve, again, just, uh, just using linear interpolation. Don't worry, we'll, we'll take this one step at a time. Okay, so does everybody have a gradation sheet? Everybody have one? Okay, all right. Let's take a look at this. All right, so I've got here a specification so is everybody clear when I say here's the spec limits? These spec limits come from something like ASTM C33 or something similar, that for a given aggregate size, here are the, the limits, that either 80% or 100% must pass somewhere in between for that aggregate to meet the spec. Is everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So here's the specification limits. 
And you know, take a look at, at any one of these. Like for instance, take a look right here, the 3 8 inch. The percent passing has to be somewhere between 70% and 90%. Now aggregate A, that's only, or 100% passes, so it's too fine. 54%, that's too coarse. It doesn't meet the spec. Either one of these aggregates doesn't meet the spec. But the idea, if I use a little bit of A and a little bit of B, I can blend these together and make an aggregate that does meet the spec. So we're going to take this one step at a time, and I'm, and I'm going to start off by, um, by looking at this chart. Now I'm going to need y'all's help um, as I go back and forth on this. You are going to help me out with this. Okay. So you all have a chart that looks something like this. Okay. So let's take our time with this. Let's see if, if I can actually get this drawn out on the screen. might work out pretty nifty if it does. Okay. So let's just take this one step at a time. Okay. I actually find it a little easier in, in these instances. I don't know why it's just sort of my visual way of doing this. I find it a little easier to actually start with the really, really fine sieve and work my way backwards. So I'm actually going to start with the number 200 sieve. Okay. So with the number 200 sieve, what do we have for aggregate A? We have what? The 12% passes the number 200 and for aggregate B, 0% passes. Does everybody see that? I'm looking at that right there, the 12 and the 200. Everybody okay with that? So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to find, let's see, on aggregate A, that's 12%. What's that about right there? Maybe I can do a little better than that. Maybe about right there. Is that okay? And then for aggregate B, what was it, zero? Okay. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect these with a straight line, which I'm going to draw this on the screen. It's not going to be straight, I promise. I'm not that good. Now I get something like this. Okay? I propose that this is what I'm calling the number 200 civ line. In fact, on mine, I actually went ahead and put something like a 200 right here, and I actually labeled it. Okay? So, just so everybody's clear, what I've got here, aggregate number A, 12% passes the number 200. Aggregate number B, none of it passes the number 200. So if I blended it 50-50, half aggregate A, half aggregate B, I propose I would get an aggregate where about 6% passes the number 200. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? That's the idea. And we're using this graphical approach to determine that. Now I did the number 200, the number 100, would be something like, what's it on A? What was the number 100? 21. So maybe something about like that. Oof, I can do better than that. Maybe something about like that. And what was the, uh, what was it on, on B side? Zero. So it would go back here again. So maybe something like that. Does everybody see the pattern? Okay. Okay. So take a minute and, and continue to fill that out. And go, go ahead and do each sip. Also, make sure that you, I, I think it's really important to put a label on each line. Make sure to put your labels sort of really close to the axis. Like I've got mine labeled like all the way over here, maybe all the way over there. Because we're going to fill this in with more data. So. Everybody need this? Okay.
Just take your time. No significant rush. Still need another couple minutes. That's fine. Here, I tell you what. I should have zoomed in on this a little more. Is that a little better? Sorry about that. something up real quick. Everybody good or? Okay. What you should have is a plot that looks something about like this. Oh, my lines are trailing from the previous screen. Oh, well. Okay. So what I've got here is I've got the percent passing on A and the percent passing on B. These lines are from the previous screen, so you can ignore that. But if you notice, I also went ahead and drew the actual percent. I actually wrote it. Percent passing, so we're up at 179, 66, 41, 38, 21, and 12. That actually came from the table. And then 192, 54, 24, 3, 1, and 0, and whatnot on this side. Does everybody sort of see where that's coming from? Another thing that I tried to do, um, I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Let me, let me erase this. This is sort of bugging me. Okay. Okay. Again, another thing I tried to do was actually put on there the sieve size. And again, you kind of want to hug this over on this side if you're going to label it because we're probably going to be plotting some bounds and you don't want to be drawing on top of one another. So you can see the 200, 100, 50, 30, 8, 4, and then 3 eighths, uh, 1 half. And if you notice the 3 quarters, it's 100 and 100, right? So it's actually just that top axis. So regardless of how much we blend, we're gonna ha it's all going to pass the, the 3 quarter. Yes, sir? You don't, you don't have to. I just, so you see where the numbers are coming from. You, you don't necessarily have to. It is a good way of checking to make sure every, making sure everything is right. You know, as you write down the numbers, you can look at your number four line and see, okay, I got 2479. Does that match what I had in the example? You know, 24 and 79. So you don't have to, but it's not a bad idea. Is everybody okay with this? Any questions? Okay. Now, let's, let's sort of take a look at, at some of the specifications because I, I do want to take my time and make sure that you understand this idea of lower bound and upper bound. Again, I think it's easiest to focus on the smaller sieves because I think the numbers are a little easier. Okay, so let's get the number 200. Would you agree, okay, so everybody's clear that 12% passes with aggregate A, nothing passes with aggregate B. 
Would you also agree that if I literally had a, a bowl of aggregate A and a bowl of aggregate B, equal weight, mix them together, 50% and 50%, that if we just assume linear interpolation, 6% would pass with the blend? Does that make sense? Would that blend, just 50 and 50, would that meet the spec if all we were doing is looking at the number 200? Yeah, because this blend has to be anywhere from 4 to 10. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Let, let's, let's look at that graphically. So you should have a plot that looks something about like this. Okay? Now, this is what I want to do. I want to start off with the 200. Okay, so what was the range? It was 4 to 10? Okay, all right. So what I want to do is this is a straight line. Now, I've got the same scale on this side as I do this side. What I want to do is I want to find where the number 4 is. So what do we say? Something about like that. Do you agree that's about a number 4? So the number 200 line, number 2, probably somewhere about in here. Do you agree with that? Something about like that. Hence why straight edges really matter here. So something about like that. I'm going to say that that passes right around here. So, okay, we'll say it's about like that. Okay, so there's that. And then the 10, the 10's easy because the grid lines fall on it, so we can just say that's about right here. Does that make sense? So I say, I propose this, okay, so that's 4 and that's 10. Make sense? Now let's be clear with the blends. The blends have to add up to be 100%. In other words, if I use like 10% of A, I'm using 90% of B. If I'm using 20% of A, I'm using 80% of B. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. So would you agree that if I use anywhere from like, I don't know, 36% of A to 85% uh, of A, if all we cared about was the number 200 sieve, we'd be meeting the spec. Everybody okay with that? Okay, now let's do the next one. Okay, so if anybody has it printed out, do you know what the next one is? 8 to 16 on the, on the 100, right? So let's, let's sort of follow that through. So if I've got 8, what's that? I'm going to go something about... Something about like right there, about, makes sense. And the 16, 16 is about like right here, maybe something around in this region. Everybody okay with that? You all have straight edges so you can sort of follow along with me. I, what I have drawn on mine is I have the number 8 about right here. And I have the 16 about like right here. So this is, I'll say this is 16 and I'll say this is 8. That makes sense? Now, if you, if that, you know, that inner sort of region, if that didn't make much sense, I think it'll make a lot of sense right now. Let's go back to the number 200. You agreed that if I use anywhere from 36 to, let's say 85, that I would meet the spec for the number 200 SIP. Everybody okay with that? Okay. What about the number 100 SIP? Like what if I use an 80-20 blend? It would meet the requirements for the number 200. Would it meet the requirements for the number 100? No, because if I use 80-20, that's going to fall outside the acceptable range. Does that make sense? So what we're essentially going to do is we're going to connect these lower bound and upper bound limits, and that inner range is the only one that meets all of them. Make sense? So you think about it like this. This, this right here, this is our acceptable number 200 range. This is our acceptable number 100 range. From here to here, if all we did is cared about those two, two blends, or those two sieves, this shaded region, this green region right here, I'm sort of trying to fill that in a little bit, that would be the only range of acceptable blends that meets both of them. Does that make sense? 
Everybody okay with that? Okay. So without, you know, giving away the final answer, I'm going to flash it on the screen real quick and then I'll let you all work on it. But essentially, your next step is this. So you've got sieve lines that look like this. What you need to do is turn that into this. Okay. So if you look here on the bottom, you know, I've got the, I know it's blurry a little bit, but I've got the 4 and the 8 and the 10 and the 16. You need to go through and fill that out with the rest of the remaining gradation. Okay. Now, I will sort of point something out. You're going to come, you're going to arrive at a little bit of a problem regarding this 80. And just sort of put it somewhere on the axis. It's not really going to matter anyways. But you'll see that when you get to the last uh, sieve where it says the 80%. You'll see what I mean. Just sort of locate it somewhere on the axis. Um, let me go ahead and pull this up. Is that what you need? That? All right. So go ahead and, and continue to work on that. So we already did this one and this one. Go ahead and do the others. Take your time with that. It can be a little bit of a bookkeeping issue. Um, just take your time with it. Remember, you can connect all your upper bounds and your lower bounds. Right. In other words, connect all the numbers on the right and the numbers on the left of your given spec limits. It's a little tedious, but it's not so bad, right? Okay, like um, you're trying to locate that on a line. There's probably no line to find it. So just sort of put it right there. You see, you're talking about the half-inch sieve, and the half-inch sieve goes from 92 to 100, and the spec limit, you know, has to be 80. So just somewhere in between. You can if you want, and we'll, we'll talk about how we, how we do that here in a second, but just make sure that you hug that, that lower bound as much as you can and, and the upper bound. In fact, in fact, let me do this. Do you all need a, a little bit more, any more time, or are you good? Okay. Okay. Because I'll pull up the, like, this step two, if you will, to make sure everything matches what it should. What's that?
Everybody, you good? All right. Um, what you should have is a plot that looks something like this. Okay. Does everybody have this? Okay. Now this last one, you needed to locate the number 80 on this line, but there's no 80 there. So just locate it somewhere over here. It's not a big deal anyways because the spec says it has to be somewhere between 80 and 100 and you've got 100 on one aggregate and 92 on the other. Long and short of it is, whatever your blend is, you're going to meet the requirements for this one, so it, it, it doesn't really matter. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. Now, does everybody agree, or, or, does everybody kind of see what I was talking about with this whole, you know, range of applicability? In other words, if all I cared about was the number 200, anywhere from here to here would be acceptable. But be, if all I cared about was the number 100, anything from here to here is acceptable. If all I cared about was the number 50, anything from here to here is acceptable. What I have to do is come up with a blend that meets all of them. So I propose take the absolute worst case scenario from the lower bound and from the upper bound and create a range. So if I'm going on the lower bound, go all the way over, all the way over, all the way over. I propose that one right there is the worst case scenario, that 35. And then over here, all the way over, all the way over, all the way over. And I propose right there, that 23. That's the worst case scenario on the upper bound. So in other words, here's the aggregate with the lower and upper bounds. There's my range. Before, after. Before, after. Does everybody see that? So. What I've done is this, is, okay, so let me explain where a lot of these numbers are coming from. So first off, let's look at the solid green vertical lines. So this is what I'm proposing is the worst case scenario on the uh, lower bound ranges and on the upper bound. So if I look at the bottom, the percent passing, I'm getting about, like, if that's the point right there, that's 50, that's 55, that's something like 52. Does everybody see that? This is 52. 62. Does that make sense? Everybody see that? So if this is 52, up here that's 48. And if this is 62, that's 38. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So I propose from a blending standpoint, anywhere between using 52% of, uh, of aggregate A and 62% of aggregate A would work. Is everybody okay with that? So if you were going to tell somebody what to use, what do you think is the best answer that absolutely ensures that it meets spec? The middle. So between 52 and, and, uh, and 62, I propose the middle. So I propose that if, if you want to blend these two aggregates to meet the specification, use 57% of aggregate A and 43% of aggregate B. Is everybody okay with that? That's not so bad, is it? I'm sure you're getting like 56 and 44, 55 and 45. That's no big deal. That's no big deal. In fact, I bet you, if I just did this problem again, you know, the fact that I'm a little bit of a sloppy drafter, that I'd probably get a little bit of a different answer. But, I mean, keep in mind, you got a range. You're not getting 52 or 62, are you? I mean, for your final answers. So, so yeah. Everybody okay with that? Now, what are these numbers down the middle? Does anybody guess what these numbers are down the middle? This, like, you know, 56, 39, 24, 22. Does anybody know what those are? It depends on the sieve. Specifically, that is how much we expect to pass that sieve with, with the two aggregates blended. In other words, if I blend these aggregates accordingly with 57% of A and 43% of B, and I look at, let's say, the number four sieve, well, the number four sieve is this line right here, right? This diagonal line right there. If I'm looking at the blend, which is right here, how much should pass the number four sieve? Well, I say 56%. You see what I mean? How much should pass the number eight sieve? right there. 
Was that about 39%? Something like that? Does everybody see that? What's that? This is my blend, right? If I'm looking at a particular sieve, let's say the number eight sieve, how much should pass that sieve with the blend? Or, or it doesn't really matter. It's the same way. Does that make sense? See, I think it's a little fuzzy like when you see it, but when you actually do it, you go, oh, okay, it's not so bad, right? Make sense? Any questions so far? I want to pull something up real quick to highlight a couple things. Let me delete this because I want to do this together. Okay. All right. So before I show you this, does anybody have any questions? Now, you brought up a good point because you said, you know, what if I'm getting like 56 or, or 55 or whatnot because of the drawing? You know, that's, it's kind of tough. Let's say you want to actually do the math to check and see what your final answer is going to be. All right. So let's look at this. So what I have here is just a table in Excel and it's nothing more than the um, it's nothing more than the, uh, the the aggregate percent passings for each or percent passings for each aggregate. So it's 100, 179, 66, what have you. This literally just came directly from uh, from here. Okay? Now what did we agree was the final answer? What was it? 57% of A and 43% of B? Okay, if you're worried about your, um, the quality of your plot, you know, and, and your ability to, 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 to draw all that, let's just calculate what this was going to be. Everybody agrees this is all straight lines, right? So why don't I just take equals 57% of whatever's in A plus 43% of whatever's in B, okay? And just calculate that out, okay? Now, you'll look, look at some of these numbers. I guarantee you these numbers are a little different than what's in my plot. Like, for instance, the number 8, uh, what, what I got, 38.91. I think I got 39. But this one, like the number 4 sieve, I got 56. And I compute it, and I get like 55.35. So, you know, graphing, if you're looking at your percent passing, it's probably going to be a little off. But this can just sort of be a really quick check to see if you actually meet the specifications. So what you could do is you could say, all right, I've actually come up with a blend. It's 57% and 43%. Let's do the math, and then let's just compare it against the specs. So, oh, goodness. Now let's just one by one check and see if this works. So. So this is me calculating my blends, 57% of A, 43% uh, of B. Does the three-quarter inch sieve meet? Yep. The half inch, it's got to be between 80 and 100. 96, does that meet? Yeah. The three-eighths, 70 to 90, that meets, right? Uh, number four, 50 and 70, that meets. 35 and 50, that meets. 18 and 29, that meets. 13 and 23, that meets. That meets that means. Does everybody see that? So if you're iffy as to whether or not you're, you've actually drafted it appropriately, just do the math and see it. It's not that bad, right? Pretty straightforward calculation. Does anybody have any questions about this? Yes, sir. That's a good question. And that, that is dependent on the proportion of aggregates that we're going to talk about later. In other words, you'd have a different proportion of gravel, sand, cement, and water if you were trying to get 4 KSI concrete versus trying to get 8 KSI concrete. It depends on what we're after. There, but let me be clear, to, to actually develop a mix design that meets a certain you know, FC prime or, or KSI is a process. It all starts with ensuring that our ingredients meet the basic spec, and, and that's what we're doing here. So this isn't like 
this would be sand for 4 KSI, but for 8 KSI, it would be a different sand. That, that, that's, that's not really the, the right question to ask, but that will become a little clearer when we do mixed designs later. Does that make sense? All right. Any other questions? This isn't so bad, is it? Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, I do want to at least briefly illustrate some of the, uh, the concepts that I did here. D did this make sense, what I just did, where I said, you know, well, 57% of this number and 43% of this number will get you uh, a property? Does that make sense? Good, because that, that's, that's how you, it, for the most part, that's how you determine properties of blended aggregates. In, in other words, when you do a laboratory experiment, you're doing a laboratory experiment, let's say, on aggregate A, and a laboratory experiment on aggregate B. Well, you've got the properties for each of those aggregates. If you blend them, what's the, uh, the property of the composite aggregate? Okay. Well, for the most part, it's a weighted percentage. Okay. So, so I want to take a look at this. So here's the example we just did, and this is the next slide. This is looking at blending of aggregates. So if you want to compute the properties of a blend, you essentially just use a weighted average for, for each aggregate. So that could be things like, you know, percent passing a given sieve. It could be things like moisture content or, um, or angularity or something like that. Any property that, property that is not specific gravity or density, you can compute using the following approach. So it's basically, if you're after some property X of a blend, let's say you're after the angularity of a given blend. So in the lab last time, uh, we were looking at properties of coarse aggregate, and we said how many of them are angular, how many of them are rounded, you know, so on and so forth. You all remember that? So if you've got the angularity of aggregate A and the angularity of aggregate B, and you want to determine the uh, angularity of the blend, well, if you got 40% of A and 60% of B, just 40% times A and 60% times B and add them up. That's it, okay? So X would be your composite property, X sub I would be the property of each individual aggregate, and P would be the fraction of how much aggregate goes into the blend. So remember, the sum should be 100%. So if you got two aggregates, you got 40% of aggregate A, you need 60% of aggregate B. Does that make sense? All right. Let me go through a, a really quick example. Um, and I think this one's pretty straightforward. So if I have two stockpiles of fine aggregate, and they have known angularity of 35% and 70%. And again, this works for any property that's not specific gravity, a uh, specific gravity or unit weight. Because of the division involved, you, you calculate those uh, blended properties a little bit differently. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a little different. Um, but if you have two stockpiles of, of fine aggregate, and you've got angularity values. So aggregate A has an angularity value of 35%. And aggregate B has an uh, angularity va value of 70%. So you know your answer is going to be somewhere between 35% and 70%. Well, how much? Well, if you've blended them to where you got 40% of A and 60% of B, determine the percent angularity of the blend. It, it's really simple. It's really not that bad. So if you're looking at this particular problem, I'm going to start off by looking at the angularity values. Okay, so the angularity values, those are just the individual properties of each aggregate. So I propose that's um, X sub A is 35% and X sub B is 70%. Now the big thing to keep in mind, these values can be whatever. I mean, I've got 35 and 70. They really can be whatever. It's just linear interpolation. The only contingency on these values is looking at the blend. So if I look at the blend, I'm using 40% of A and 60% of B. So that's a percentage of 40% of A and 60% of B. Now the X values, they can be whatever they want, but the P values, they have to add up to be 100%. Everybody okay with that? Because again, you're taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that. 
adding them up to make a, a, given, um, a, a given aggregate. So if I want to determine the angularity of the composite blend, so therefore the composite angularity for x is just going to be a weighted average. So 40% of 35 and 60% of 70. Now, because these are percentages, if you do this calculation straight, like literally just take these numbers and plug them into your calculator, you're going to get a really big answer. It's really more appropriate for a problem like this to actually convert them back to their decimal forms. So this is going to be 0 0.4 times 0 0.35 plus 0 0.60, 0 0.70. So somebody tell me what you get for that. 0 0.56. Do I have a second on that? So I propose that the angularity of the blend is 56%. Again, somewhere between 35 and 70. Does that make sense? This isn't so bad, right? Pretty simple, basic stuff. Any questions? Okay, so here's what my plan is. So next time, uh, when it comes to lecture, uh, we're just going to cancel lecture. Okay? We are going to meet here on Thursday in this room at 2 o'clock. Okay? So we meet in this room at 2 o'clock and we go into the lab. All right? Um, next Tuesday, we will probably meet to close up everything with aggregates and then begin uh, some discussion on cement and concrete. Let me be clear on something because I know everybody's going to ask, so I'll go ahead and mention this now. The introductory concepts and the aggregate stuff, that's exam one. Okay? When we start talking about cement, we start talking about concrete, that's exam two. So exam one, introductory concepts and aggregates. So homework one, homework two, and probably homework three, but I don't think homework three is going to really be that big of a deal because it's just going to be closing up your labs and uh, maybe a blending problem. Sound good? Yes, sir. All right. That's all I got.